Good morning. Thank you for all coming. I think a uh, few people might be lost out on the parking lot trying to find their way there. I thought it was kind of well marked, but maybe I was wrong. But people are starting to uh, finish off coming in. So again, thank you for coming. Just a little housekeeping. Um, Restrooms are, if you go out the doors, ladies to my right, men's to my left. And if there's an emergency, we have five doors, four doors lit up for, with X signs. Take a left or a right, you'll find your way out of the building. So today we're going to open with uh, Jeff Chanel. He's the chair of the Brockton License Commission. He's going to just say a few words. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's always great to have the ABCC from Boston come down and try to educate us on, you know, things that are new, things that are current, questions, concerns. Um, but I'd like you to introduce you to the local commission. So in, in attendance today are myself, Scott um, Allman, Robert Simpson, commissioner, and I believe, is that Janet? Hey, hey Janet. Janet's here, Janet Lane home and myself, Jeff Charnel. Um, and again, I'd like to introduce uh, Sylvia Carvalho, our executive aide. Um, Sylvia is a staff of one, <laughs> just to let everybody know. I know I said that the last time that we were here. Um, we, renew, we renew thousands of licenses in the city, um, not only liquor, but um, auto repair, fortune telling, only have one of those, but you know, tons of licenses that need to be renewed in the city. Um, and we work um, in conjunction with the law department. We have a representative here as well. Uh, but just like to welcome everyone. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have some questions and answers at the end. And we appreciate you guys for coming them out. Thank you. So my name is Deputy Chief Edward Williams. I'm head of the Fire Prevention Bureau. I'll be speaking today talking about what we look for when we go in to inspect the premises. I have uh, Bill Forty, I forgot to put his name up there as I was doing it. He's Deputy Commissioner with the Inspectional Services Department, being that of the building department that we have now. Uh, we have uh, Sergeant Graham with the Brockton Police Department representing the license agents. I have my members of my staff here in the audience if you have any questions when we're through. Uh, we'll go over what the fire department, building department looks for, and then we'll also go over the license commission rules for the city of Brockton that you may not be aware of. And then the ABCC has a presentation that they'll be putting on. I'd like to thank Massasoit Community College and Chief Chris Cummings for hooking us up here. Uh, normally we have this at the War Memorial Building, but that's under renovation and not ready for us to be there yet. I'd like to thank Brockton Community Access for uh, coming and filming this, so it will be on uh, the BCA website, YouTube, so you can watch it again or have your employees watch it. That might be a great idea. And I'd like to thank Sylvia Cavallo for doing all the work, sending out all the invitations and getting everybody here. So certificate of inspection inspections. If you own a bar, restaurant, a uh, place that serves alcohol to people, uh, you have to have a certificate of inspection. Why, why do we get certificates of inspections? Uh, what type of facilities? Who, what do we inspect for? That's what we're going to be talking about today. But we have to remember why we do it. In Massachusetts, or in the United States, we've had the four deadliest nightclub fires uh, around. The last being the Station Nightclub back in 2003, where 100 people died. And people from Brockton were in that fire and are permanently disfigured because of that. We don't want that to happen here in the city of Brockton. That's what the crowd looked like that night in the station nightclub. And when the fireworks went off and everything got lit on fire, everybody tried to get out the doors. They had security guards telling people they couldn't leave exits. They started piling up like cordwood at the door. It was awful. So the common uh, issues that they have are lack of adequate egresses in the place, blocked or obstructed exits, flammable decorations and overcrowding, all things that we want to prevent in the city. So back when that happened, the state developed a task force and they came up with better sprinkler system laws, egress laws, we've regulated pyrotechnics more, 
interior finishes, training and education for everybody, new and enhanced fire uh, fines for criminal and criminal penalties, and um, they gave us some funding back in 2003, but that has disappeared. So they added a retroactive sprinkle law. If you've been in the business for a while, you'll remember when all of a sudden you got a letter from me telling you you had to sprinkle your business or you had to drop down under 100 people occupancy. And that's proved, uh, become very successful. But we also look for the blocked egresses. Um, we make sure that you have your fire protection systems maintained, no storing of flammable explosives, unpermitted use of fireworks, and we try to make sure that you don't exceed uh, occupancy limits. Brockton's, if you go out on a Saturday night, Brockton's got a great nightlife. Up and down Main Street, um, all the clubs are crowded. It's pretty amazing. So one of the things they did back in 2003 is they amended the general laws, uh, chapter 10, section 74. And basically what it said is you need to get a certificate of inspection co-signed by the fire department and the building department in order for you to get your license and renew your license and you have to keep that up. Um, they also uh, gave out some guidance that uh, the code section's wrong because this is an old slide, but if you have um, over 50 people, you're supposed to have a 44 inch inch wide path to get to your egress. Under that, it's 36. So who do we inspect for a certificate of inspection? The bars, nightclubs, not, I'm not sure anybody calls themselves a nightclub these days. Discos, I haven't seen one of them since Sammy closed his. And restaurants and social clubs like the VFW, uh, the Vega Club, things like that. And fire doors, we're big on fire doors in the city of Brockton. If you have a fire door, it needs to be closed, not blocked, and uh, no door stops or wedges and things like that. This is, we talk about this all the time. On your certificate of inspection, there's a number of people you can have in the building. That's patrons and employees. You cannot overcrowd over that or you're subject to either civil or criminal penalties. This is a sample certificate of uh, inspection. You'll see that right here, that's the total number of occupants. And remember, that's patrons and employees, dishwashers, people in the band, everybody, right here. And down right here is your expiration date. You should always plan on getting everything ready and be ready for us a month ahead of time when you expire. The fire department will show up sometime during the month prior to that expiration date to inspect you. So you should have everything ready for us when we come in. The building department, you have to flip this over, sign it, and send it into the building department, and they will uh, schedule an appointment with you. What do we look for? We look for numbers on the front of the buildings. It, we're a busy uh, department. If we're not here, we have mutual aid companies that come in. People need to find their numbers of the property. We always ask you to put them somewhere not on a door because what happens when something happens? You open the door and you can't see the number. So looking for the building numbers is important to us. Maximum number of occupants in the building. This is supposed to be posted on the wall, not just on the certificate, but you're supposed to have a sign like this telling you how many people you can be in. So if I walk in at midnight, and I take a quick glance, I should be able to see that, and then we can do a head count to see if you're overcrowded or not. Crowd manager paperwork. There's probably eight or nine people in the city that have been told they have to perform crowd management. That's if you have over 100 people and you have loud entertainment and things like that. That's when you've been told, and I'll probably send out a letter out confirming with everybody because we have a lot of changes to licenses but you have to have your crowd manager paperwork filled out each and every day. It can't be mimeographed. I found one establishment, they mimeographed it and were just signing it every day. And there's things you have to go through. You have to make sure your exits are blocked, your fire alarm's working, your sprinkler's working, um, things like that. And then you sign off. This paperwork has to be kept on site so we can examine it at any time. And we get the excuses, oh, I took it home with me to organize it. Oh, it's, it's in my car. 
No, it has to be on site when we walk in the door. So that's very important. Path of egresses. This is a typical path of egress that we run across in the city. There's a hallway. It's a great place for storage. But if in the emergency, you're not going to get out that way. So please, look at the pathways that you have and make sure that they're clear. We make sure the exit doors are working. Sometimes you go to the old doors in the back of the buildings and they haven't been used in six years and you try to push it and it doesn't open. So we always make sure that the doors actually open. Or you get out back and you see that all the yard debris and everything up is, else is piled up against it and you can't get out the door if you tried. And remember that a path of egress needs to take you to a public way, just not into a parking lot. It can't take you into a fenced area. It has to take you outside and you have to get to the public way. So in this case, that set of stairs has deteriorated and people wouldn't get to the public way. It's always important, you can't have dock, dock, dock in your premises. You have to have at least one foot candle of light at the walking distance so you can see where your feet are going. Some places we've gone into at night and it's so dark you can't see where you're going. You've got to at least have one foot candle down below. And that can be achieved by just putting lights in. Like Remember the old theaters? Um, they used to have lights down low so you could see the floor. Emergency lighting. This is important. If the power goes out, these lights are supposed to come on. What happens, we find, is the power went out sometimes during the year. It strained the batteries. The batteries won't take a recharge. So you, as part of your checklist in your establishment, you should be checking these. You press a little button on the bottom of the side, and they come on. But we'll, we'll always check these also. Exit signage, we want to make sure the, the exits are lit so that if the power goes out or there's a smoke condition, these signs will shine bright and we'll be able to find our way to an exit. So we'll be looking at those. Fire alarm systems, if you have a fire alarm in your property, we want to make sure that it's maintained and working. So you should have a alarm company or electrician go through your system on a yearly basis and have paperwork ready for us to look to show that that the system's been maintained. And we don't want to walk up and look at the panel and find out you have several troubles in the panel. That's not acceptable. Sprinkler system. Um, we want to make sure it's been uh, maintained the last 12 months. We, Captain Tropiano's been very instrumental in checking all the systems in the city, but it's up to you to remember to get the guy there to do the check and give us the paperwork. We don't want to have to remind you. And when you get it, send it to us and we'll put it on file so we know. We run into impairments to the sprinkler system. People paint the sprinkler heads. That's a definite no-no. You can't do that. We find holes in ceilings. And how a sprinkler head works is when the heat rises to the sprinkler head, the heat affects the sprinkler head and the water starts to come out. It comes out in an, L, um, an umbrella fashion. If there's a hole in the ceiling, the heat will take the least path of resistance and go up above the ceiling. And you could have a rolling fire above the ceiling before the sprinkler head will ever know about it. So we always look to make sure that a ceiling area is very tight. Um, obstructions to, to discharge. If you have a head here, or it's hanging down, you can't have something next to it hanging lower because it's not going to allow the water to spread out like that umbrella that you're supposed to. And then we come in to find people hanging stuff on sprinkler pipes. They take the, um, the little lights and they wrap the pipe with it. You can't have anything hanging on a sprinkler pipe. And then we always look for things that happened while we were gone in the last year. Uh, whether it was building permittable work, taking down a wall, putting up a wall, changing your bathroom, enlarging a room, that all requires a building permit. And it also would require um, an application to the ABCC and the License Commission to um, change your premises. Any electrical work, whether it be changing an outlet, adding an outlet, new light fixtures, that is all an electrical um, permit requirement, have your electrician pull a permit. They, they don't cost that much, you get an inspection out of it and you make sure it's safe. Electrical fires can cause a lot of problems, so you wanna make sure that happens. Any plumbing work, 
we always know when we walk into a place and we see PVC plumbing in a place that someone did it that doesn't know what they're doing and it wasn't done by permit because you can't have PVC in a uh, commercial establishment. So whenever you do, you change a sink, you move a sink, you add something, make sure you get a plumbing permit for it. And gas work, if you're doing any gas work, say you have your kitchen line and you decide to put in three new fryer laters, you need to get a gas permit to do that and the gas inspector will inspect it. And that it would also require you to re-aim your fire suppression system. Speaking of fire suppression systems, these have to be maintained every six months. Make sure someone comes in, goes through the tank, sometimes the tanks uh, lose pressure. Make sure the mechanisms work. There's little um, elements within the hood that will melt if there's a fire and set the system off. They have to be changed because they get so grease covered that they may not work. So every six months for your suppression system. And then cleaning of your kitchen, your hood. That has to be done maybe every three months, maybe if you're Burger King, maybe every two months because you do a lot of cooking. Or it could be every six months. Or if you're a, a place like um, one of the clubs in the city that ne never cooks, it's once a year it has to be inspected and, and cleaned. So make sure that's done before we get there. And the same, they have to go up on the roof and they have to clean the uh, systems up on the roof and make sure that there's no problem. We, in the past year, we've had two good grease fires in hoods, and we, we don't like to see that happen. We also have a problem with the quality of the cleaning when the people get there. Um, make sure, inspect it yourself. Make sure the guy, you get your money's worth. Make sure the guy that does the cleaning actually does a decent job. Fire extinguishers, they have to be inspected on a yearly basis. The one right here, um, that's a K extinguisher. That should be in your kitchen. You should have these placed around your establishment with signage that says where they're supposed to be. They shouldn't be on the floor, they should be hung on a wall, but that's the things we'll check. Drapery curtains, furniture, and decorations must meet at NFPA standard 701. And that, what that means is they won't easily catch on fire. And if we've come across a lot of new establishments, they go on Amazon and they buy their furniture, their drapes, things like that. When you do that, you can't get your fire certs and we tell you you can't use your stuff. You have to be able to present us with a fire certification to make sure the stuff is safe. You don't want a very flammable curtain hanging on a window that will catch fire real fast and maybe block the exit. So that's a very important thing for us. Again, some of the fancy curtains, um, you never know. And then everybody likes to use candles. Um, I'm finding more and more people are going to the battery operated candles, which are great. You just shut them off at night. But I was actually in a restaurant last week that had real candles, which I hadn't seen in a while. If you're going to use candles, make sure that they're safe. Don't let them boil down to all the wax is gone and it becomes a bubbling liquid inside. That's when the candle vase or jar will break open and the hot liquid will go everywhere and start a fire. Um, you're much better off with the battery ones. I would recommend it highly. If you have a patio or patio heaters and you're using propane, if you have more than two tanks like this on your premises, you have to be permitted for your propane. And don't store these in the building. Build yourself a little cage outside to keep them in, but we can't have propane inside the building. And this is a great book, The Killer Show. This was a book written about the station nightclub fire, and this is by the lawyer that did it. And he tells you how he sued everybody that thought about going to the nightclub that night or had anything to do with it. And he got, I think it was over $100 million out of people without ever going into court. Um, no trials, everybody just donated the money because they knew they were in trouble. Um, I forget what company it was, it was a beer company. They just advertised the program and sold beer to the place. They got sued. So if anything happens, anybody that's kind of got their fingerprints on the thing, they're gonna get sued. We had a case in Brockton um, probably 15, 20 years ago. We unfortunately had someone die in a fire and it didn't have the proper egresses. Well, the lawyers got a hold of it and they sued everybody that ever did anything in that building. Guy that laid down the floor, he got sued because he didn't notice there was two egresses. And I spent several days in Boston in court and it was awful seeing all these contractors 
be in there and paying out money because they didn't report something. So be very careful, uh, read this book and understand this is how we look at it. Even the fire department got sued down there. They got sued because they didn't do their job. The building department got sued, they didn't do their job. It's really an eye opener to what can happen to you. So um, if you, you can buy it on Amazon, it's like 20 bucks, um, definitely get it and read it. Any questions on the fire department and building department portion of it? Bill, do you want to say anything? Five minutes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this, uh, this seminar. Um, my name is uh, Bill Forty. I'm the Deputy Building Commissioner for the Inspectional Services Department in the City of Brockton. Uh, just recently, we combined our um, inspectional department with the health inspection. So assuming that most of you, <coughs> excuse me, Assuming that most of you serve food as part of your, um, your, your liquor license establishment, um, we, uh, we're a little bit more um, cohesive now with our inspections, and so I would encourage you to also make sure that your food permits are, um, are up, to, um, you know, up to date and that your, um, that your staff is trained properly. Um, so to just kind of um, reiterate on um, Mr. Williams' um, presentation, by the way, great presentation. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Williams covered all the basics. Um, I think it's important to know uh, that um, that code enforcement and code compliance is a buy-in. Okay, um, it requires as much cooperation on your side as it does ours. We're we're the code officials. We we enforce. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I, I think that you all really need to understand the huge responsibility that goes with serving alcohol. Um, and, and um, you know, essentially, when someone comes into your establishment, you're taking their life in your hands. You are responsible. You're the responsible party who's providing the entertainment. And I, I can't think of any one of us here that doesn't want a business to prosper and to, uh, you know, and to, and to make it um, in the city and be able to, um, you know, have people come out and enjoy. I, I enjoy going out to a nice show, and I, I enjoy going out to dinner, and I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always... Um, fascinated by places that are run and managed correctly. Um, but, but more importantly, I think it's, it's, it's imperative for you to know that people's lives are in your hands. Um, when we go out and do our yearly inspection, everything looks nice, everything's cleaned up, everything, the boxes are all taken care of and there's no blocked means of egress and you've had your, your, you know, your um, certificate issued and everything as well. But, but really, that's where the work begins. Um, as you as, as club owners and establishment owners um, should know that, that you know, every single day we, we count on you to be our eyes and ears um, in, in these establishments. Um, I actually became a building inspector through the tragedy of the Station Nightclub fire. It got me fascinated and interested in building safety. And um, if you haven't watched the video, the two and a half minute video um, online, please do. Um, it will be an eye opener to you and you will, you will definitely understand what we do and why we do it. Um, so essentially, um, you know, we're hoping that um, through this um, informational uh, seminar that you, you know, that you gain an interest in, in your club's safety, that you, that you, you know, take to heart the, the importance of making sure that your your staff is properly trained and that your establishment is clean and it stays that way. Um, we are, uh, when we do our inspection, we, we try to be as thorough as possible, but again, that responsibility once we leave pretty much falls on you. Um, Deputy Chief Williams went over a few things. Um, just, just to give a little bit of a, just kind of an establishment of authority. So, so what happens with the building department, the, the building inspector um, issues the certificate of occupancy. Um, anything you do in your club, uh, whether it's uh, changing around permanent seating, whether it's um, you know building a new bar, or whether it's creating a you know e even partitions that are more than six feet are regulated by the building code. It it's always imperative that you come and speak to us and tell us what you're doing. Um, if you're doing a significant floor plan change, that floor plan change is public record. That's what you're supposed to have. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's any harm in putting a couple tables together so that a, a couple, you know, that four people can eat together. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about major changes in fixed seating or unfixed seating. Um, when when you um, 
when you do things like add like a dance area and stuff like that, all of that is supposed to be looked at and calculated by a design professional or an architect. That particular floor plan becomes the public record. And so when we go in to inspect, that's what we're looking at. Um, in addition to that, um, if you are a club that you're not sprinklered and you have more than 99 persons, you are allowed to uh, uh, attain a, a one-time permit uh, from both the fire chief and the building commissioner uh, for events. I think you can do up to three a year if, if for some reason you think you're going to have a bigger crowd than what you're allowed to have. Okay, So that would be in the instance of even if you have, uh, even if you have sprinklers and you're going to exceed your maximum occupant load. You know, again, we want to see you succeed, but, but our number one job here is safety. So don't ever be afraid to come and approach us for uh, questions and concerns about what you're doing in your club. We would much rather have you come in and at least give you the guidance of what you need to be able to perform and have the kinds of events and activities that you want to have. Um, so um, that information is, is, always, um, is always free. It's, it's always better to come and talk to us first. Uh, if, you, if you're thinking about um, doing a rearrangement of your seating or you want to build a bar or you want to do something like that, just come and talk to us. It's a lot easier. Um, we want to make sure that you are well informed uh, and that, um, that, that, again, your attention to detail goes far beyond um, what, is, um, you know, what is required at the time uh, of your inspection. So uh, are there any questions from, uh, from the audience about um, what we do here in the Inspectional Services Department? I think I covered just about everything. I know that Ed did a great job in, in kind of giving you an idea of what we look at. but. Um, if, you, if there's no questions, uh, I'm available. Uh, I'll be here in the front row after. Feel free to come up and, and talk to me then. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So the next part that I'm going to go over is the Brockton Lights Commission has rules and policies that have to be followed. And we've got a lot of new establishments, new management in these establishments, so we thought it was important to go over these. So if you go on the Brockton uh, License Commission, City of Brockton website, the License Commission page, over on the right-hand side, you'll see license rules for general on-premises, that's a bar room, uh, restaurants, package stores, hotels, clubs. Go online, print this out, they're only a few pages long, and read them and understand them. I'm going to go uh, briefly over them, but it's always important to have them in. And again, have your employees or whoever you're having promote events at your club read this stuff because it's very important. It's only three pages long, um, well worth the read. So number one, any licensed holder that wants to close their business for more than 48 hours is supposed to notify the license commission in writing. And I know that's happened once in the past year that I'm aware of, but if, you, if you're going to permanently close your business for 48 hours, say you're sick and you're not going to be able to open up, you're a one-man operation. Just put, a, put an email into the license commission, document that you're closed, and you'll meet the requirements. So this is more technical stuff, but the license E can't contract bills under the license um, without certain provisions. Corporate managers um, may, must not be changed until the license commission approves such changes. So if you have a corporation and you get mad at um, one person and you want to replace them, you got to get the license commission approval. Assignment of stock, read that about that. Um, license. Licensee shall notify the License Commission of any bankruptcy proceedings that may affect the license or any other court proceedings that may um, affect the status of the holder. So if, you, if, God forbid, you get into legal trouble, just let them know that you have a problem so they can be aware of it. So there shall be no disorder, disturbance, indecency, prostitution, lewdness on the license premises or any other premises connected therewith by any interior communication, gambling, any sort, uh, except those games of chance authorized by the legislature or local licensing authorities shall be permitted on the premises. So just, I'll re I'm going to leave that one alone. Uh, Las Vegas Nights, they were very popular 25 years ago. Um, 
there's a few of them around now, but if you want to have a Las Vegas uh, night, talk to Sylvia and she'll tell you how to go through the process. So if you're a restaurant or a bar, all alcohol beverages must be sold opened and consumed on premises. You can't give a guy a six pack of beer to walk out the door, or you can't give him a bottle to open up later. It has to be open for them and they have to consume it on the premises. No licensee shall keep, store, or sell alcohol beverages in any part of the premises not specified on the license. Your license is very specific for the building you're in, or if you're in a building with multiple tenants, it will describe the premises you're in. Don't take over the space next door and make that your storage area because that's not on your license. So it would behoove everybody here to go back and see what your license premises are because we find people expanding their business without getting permission of the license commission. So go back and see what the boundaries of your license are and make sure they're correct. So this says the last drink must be served before the closing hour. All glasses and bottles must be cleared from the table about 15 minutes after the closing hour. All customers must have left the premises 30 minutes after the closing hour. Any license E or his employee should not be prohibited from being on the premises at any time for cleaning or making emergency repairs or providing security for such premises or preparing food for uh, the day's business or opening or closing the business in an orderly manner. But they must not drink. If your, your cook's in there, he can't be uh, having a beer while he's doing it. Two o'clock licenses have different rules, and we'll go over those. The license premise shall be subject to inspection by duly authorized agents of the Brockton License Commission um, and Brockton License Commissioners. The no physical renovation shall be made unless a plan is submitted and approved by the License Commission. Again, if you're going to change walls, build rooms, you need to go to the ABCC and you need to go to the License Commission for approval. And then you get the building permit after that. Um, my office reviews building permits and I've, if I see something come in for a license premises, we won't approve it until we know that you've got the okay of the city and the state to do it. Just want to make sure I got that right. Yep, okay. So this is actually a, a general law, but we talked about it. You, all, you have to have one foot candle um, lighting in the place at all times so people can see. You can't have that pitch blackness that you have to feel your way around. Very unsafe. No employee or entertainer shall solicit or induce a patron to purchasing alcohol or non-alcohol beverages for them or any other person. I'm not sure how you do that, but I have my ideas. Uh, a current list of employees shall be available upon the request of authorized agents of the License Commission or License Commissioners. I'm, I'm willing to bet 90% of you don't have a list of your employees available. You'd have to make it up. So when you go back, make one up, leave it on your desk in case someone asks. And no alcoholic beverages shall be sold for a fee less than the actual cost of the beverage to the licensee. So just bear that in mind when you, you're trying to run specials and things like that. An admission charge shall not be credited towards the purchase price of any alcohol beverage. And I recently saw an ad for an establishment in Brockton where if you bought two tickets, you got X number of bottles, and I don't believe that's acceptable. No licensee shall make any distinctions, discrimination, or restrictions on account of race, color, religious creed, national origin, sex, or ancestry relative to the admission or treatment of any person. So what that means is ladies um, get in free before 11 o'clock. You can't discriminate between the men and the women. If you let the ladies in for free, the men have to get in for free. Ladies free all night. The guys have to be free all night. Um, these are all segments of social media ads for establishments here in the city of Brockton. So it's happening in the city of Brockton, but you're breaking the rules of the license commission. So please take heed and when you, I know a lot of people have promoters that do their social media stuff, talk to them, make sure they don't put this type of thing into their, your ads. All licenses and building certificates shall be posted in a conspicuous place on the premises available at all times to the proper authorities. 
That doesn't mean, conspicuous doesn't mean in a back room be, be behind two closed doors. Put them right up front. This is actually, I took this picture down in Middleborough in an establishment. They've got their certificate of inspection, they've got their uh, alcoholic license, and then I think those were food safe permits they had up there. But they had it all right in the foyer as you walked in so you could see everything. Any police or agents complaints or reports will be kept on file until it's disposed of by the commission. If you violate a rule of the commission, you can be brought in on that violation and the commissioners can make a decision whether you did violate and what the punishment could be or whether you're innocent. No devices or electronic equipment shall be utilized by any licensed premises for the purpose of signaling employees that agents of the licensed um, authorities are there. So if the license commission, the fire department, or somebody walks in the front door, a guy can't get on his radio and say, hey, the fire department's here, the police department's here, clean up your act. That actually used to happen to me at the Brockton Hospital. They'd give a code out in the whole hospital um, to warn that we were there because we had some issues. They didn't know my wife was working there and I knew the code, so. Um, patrons are not permitted to bring alcohol beverages on the premises for their own consumption. You know, if you, if you don't serve something and they want to bring it in, that can't happen. And the license is subject to suspension, verification, or forfeiture for the breach of any of its conditions or regulations on which the license has notice or any law of the Commonwealth. So if you break the rules, break a rule of the Commonwealth, they can take action against your license. No advertising matter, screens, curtains, petitions, or other obstructions can block your windows. That's basically what it says. If you have a window in the front of your business and it's under say six feet and you can see in it, you can't tint it so you can't see in it, you can't put curtains across it so you can't see in it, that's a violation of the rules. The police officer standing outside the premises needs to be able to look into the premises and see what's going on. And all doors and windows shall remain closed at all times from 12 to noon. Sometimes you go by and you see, and this isn't really the, the new restaurants, but this goes back to the old bars where, you know, one o'clock in the morning was hot, they didn't, I mean, one o'clock in the afternoon was hot, they didn't want to put the air conditioning on, so they left the door open. Can't be open after noontime. Plus, I believe it becomes a board of health issue if you have your door open and you're serving food. You have to have a, at least a screen door. So this was a policy put in back in 2011 for the two o'clock license holders. And it's, uh, no patrons are allowed admittance after one o'clock. So if you have a two o'clock close, nobody can walk in the door after one o'clock. Not 101, not 102. One o'clock is the last time they can walk in the door. Um, any patron leaving the establishment to go out and have a cigarette, they're gone. They can't get back in after one o'clock, no matter what. Entertainment must cease at 1.30, and the last call must be made at 1.45. If you violate it, it's an automatic one hour rollback of your closing hour, as well as any other um, sanctions that they deem appropriate. So if you've got the two o'clock license, can't let anybody in after one o'clock, the entertainment stops at 1.30 and the last call is at 1.45. That's very important because we have a lot of two o'clock licenses out there and I'm, I have a feeling, a gut feeling, that they don't realize that this is actually a rule of the license commission. So please be aware of this if you have a two o'clock. Club licenses. Club licenses are for the members of the club. And we've had a couple of issues where the club hires someone to manage the premises. And then that person decides that it's now going to be a function hall open to everybody. It can't be. It needs to be um, at least sanctioned by a club member. He has to sign off and say he's sponsoring that event. So read this, understand it, talk to your attorneys about it. You may want to just apply for a general on-premises or a restaurant license rather than have the club license. Maybe a little bit more money, but you can do more things with your, your establishment. Remember, if something goes wrong and the lawyers get a hold of it and you've done something wrong against your license, um, it's going to come back at you. So try to, try to do the right thing. Back in 2014, the License Commission made a, a policy on video surveillance requirements. Any holder of a uh, restaurant license somewhere where you serve alcohol that's opened after midnight shall install and maintain security cameras 
which shall monitor and record the interior entrances and exits of the licensed establishment used by the general public to include 50 feet from all exterior entrances and exits to the licensed establishment used by the general public. So you have to have cameras inside, outside, and around the building to make sure that people are safe. The security cameras shall be operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the recordings made available to sworn officers of the Brockton Police Department, the license commission agents, code enforcement officers, or state and federal officials, or any and all investigators of activities at the licensed establishment or the surrounding areas um, to aid the investigation of criminal activity and license violations occurring to the establishment or within the surrounding neighborhood. I know that the police department have, uh, have solved assaults, murders. I've solved an arson case using these cameras. It's a great tool, but it's also a safety factor for you guys because if, you know, video tells it all. People can't make up stories about what happened. I think this protects you more than it hurts you. So please make sure your cameras are in operation at all times. And this basically says that um, the affected licenses would be notified immediately back in 2014. But if you have a license today, your camera should be in place. And I talked to Lieutenant Farrell, who's the, the new uh, commander of the Detective Bureau, and he's going to have to, he's going to start checking licenses and make sure the cameras are in fact working. And this basically says your storage on your camera system has to be 14 days. This was 10 years ago. Most camera systems now store for 30 days, um, but at least you have to have a camera system that stores for 14 days. That gives time for the smoke to clear and realize there's a problem and someone get there to get in touch with you to take a look at the cameras. The uh, penalties for this, first offense is a written warning, second offense is automatic rollback of two hours for seven days, and then third offense is two hours for 15 days, fourth offense rollback for two hours for 30 days, and any subsequent or um, an automatic rollback for two hours for 30 days. So go back, look at all your cameras, make sure they're working. Um, if they're not working, you have to notify the license commission. Um, okay, this goes, so that's for the cameras, but if your camera system's not working, you have to notify the license commission and then get, get it repaired in 48 hours. I think that's how I remember the law. This was just something for package stores, that all prices can be seen by customers in the store, whether on shelves or in circular form. Um, or otherwise must correspond with the current posted price list. And th that's more of a consumer protection thing. Um, and again, this is package stores. No alcoholic beverage shall be consumed on the premises except during wine or malt beverage tasting held in accordance with the terms and conditions of the regulations. And there's rules for wine and, and malt beverage tasting. We had one this week at uh, some guys from Brockton made a new liquor and uh, they had a wine and beer tasting up at Westgate. So. Um, you can do it, you just have to follow the rules. And that's more on the wine and malt beverage tastings. Any questions on the License Commission rules? I like it. All right, so we're going to move on to the, um, the ABC presentation. I have to go up and change slides. So I'll give you to Ralph Sacramone with the ABCC. Thank you, Chief Williams. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank everybody on behalf of the ABC Commission, Chairman Gene Larizio, uh, and myself, uh, Ralph Sacamoni. I'm the Executive Director. Uh, we thank you for everyone coming today. You take time out of your busy schedule, and we want to talk today about compliance. Uh, as you know, two years ago, we introduced this program to the City of Brockton. It's been very, very successful. So I would like everyone to understand today we're here for you. And what we're going to tell you today is how to keep yourself out of trouble. And it's, it's very simple. Everybody should have this presentation in front of you. Take notes on it, take it back to your uh, premises, use it as a training guide, everything we're gonna talk about today that on the PowerPoint presentation is in front of you in paper. So utilize that uh, fact as you will see. I'll set it to go. Ahead. All right. Today, we're gonna be uh, joining with my 
uh, General Counsel Kyle Gill in the presentation, and also Tom Carroll from the United States Department of Labor. He's in, he oversees uh, wage, hour, and uh, child labor guidelines and rules. Why we're here today is we see a lot of problems out there. We want to address them today. We want to be able to give you the tools to go forward with it, and also we're available anytime for questions as you will, you will see throughout the uh, seminar today. As you know, anybody has seen one of our seminars, we're very laid back. If we ask questions along the way, feel free. If you want to talk to us after, we'll have the entire team available to speak with anyone after. Let's talk about what we see wrong with applications. All right, once you are approved, at the local licensing authority. Then the application is sent to the ABC. It is vetted at the ABC. The ABC three-member commission votes on that application. Once they approve it, it is sent back to the city of Brockton. At that point in time, Sylvia with the city of Brockton will issue you a hard copy license. Anything from that point on that you change on your license, from the description of premises to the operating hours, to officer director changes, LLC manager changes, along with a change of manager. All of that must be approved by the Brockton Board and the ABC. Remember, a license is a privilege. It's not a guarantee. Along with this privilege comes rules and guidelines you need to follow. So what we have on this first slide, these are the common mistakes people make. Starting off with change of ownership. All right, you might have a partner, your partner decides to leave, you take in another partner. All right, there's nothing wrong with that as long as that partner gets approved by the Brockton Board and the ABC. Why do we say that? Because there are statutory disqualifications for people who have felonies. All right, they're disqualified from holding the license. It's required under the law mandated that we check character and fitness of any owner. Anyone from a one-tenth percentage to 100%, we vet the same way. So it's very, very important for that to happen. Also, you cannot give authority to this person to make decisions until they've been approved and vetted by the local board and the ABC. That's the most, uh, that is one of the top items we see all the time. Second of all, is if you are transferring your license with a change of ownership, you are responsible for everything that goes on that premises until Sylvia handles, hands the new owner the actual hard copy license. So when you do a transfer, this is what we see a lot happening. I am transferring to Ed Williams. Ed comes in, takes over my facility right away. He submits an application. He starts running the day-to-day -day affairs, making the profits, selling the alcohol, ordering the alcohol. That's a violation because that Ed has not been approved as the official owner through the transfer process of ownership. So if I am the last approved licensee and I'm selling it, I have to run it until the approval goes through the three-step approval process. City of Brockton, the ABC, and then Brockton will hand you an actual hot copy license. You are responsible for everything that goes on until, if you are the seller, until that a, a, a license is approved. So if someone leaves there intoxicated and gets in a car accident, hurts himself or hurts someone else, it's not, they're not going after the new owner because the new owner hasn't been approved yet. They're going after you as the seller. So you must maintain control at all times until the transfer has been approved. And how do you know the transfer is approved? You will have a hot copy of a license with the, with the buyer's name on it, the buyer's entity name. Any questions on that? Moving on to the next point, transfer of stock, issuance of stock or new stockholders. We covered that briefly in this. If you're bringing anybody on as an investor or a stockholder, file the application. We have it very streamlined on it. It's only a four or five page application. All the requirements are set forth in, uh, in a checklist and everything that you will need. That new person that you're bringing on board, all right, has no authority to do anything until they are vetted through the three-step process. Does everybody understand that? Going on to the next one, change your name or change your DBA. Now, the only reason we tell you this right now if it's Sacrimony's Pub and Grill, Inc., all right, and you want to change it to Sacrimony's Pub and Grill, LLC, you have to file a change of name corporation, all right? You have to file that application. It's a busy, you're actually changing the type of business you have, and you're changing the name of it. And why is this very important? I'll tell you why. 
is when it comes time to do a transfer of license, all right, what the ABC and the local board is going to be looking for is tax releases on the last approved entity. So if you want to change your name and you've been paying taxes under a new name and you have never got that approved by the Brockton Board or the ABC, you're going to have a problem when it comes to the AB, when it comes to when the ABC and Brockton Board uh, review this license. Because it's required by law under the under Chapter 62C that all debt must be uh, satisfied before the transfer can take place. So this happens a lot with clubs. All right, fraternal organizations, they change their names, and then when it comes time for them to change their office and directors, or they're trying to extend the premises, we ask for a, uh, a tax release from the Department of Revenue, Department of Employment, it comes in under another name. All right, so that leads to a violation because you did not get approval from the ABC, the Secretary of State, and the Brockton Board to change it. So that's important on changing names and DBAs that you make sure you get approval on them. The good thing about these, the DBA, there's no charge to change that name. On a DBA, it's a very simple thing. If you want to change from uh, 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 Sully's Pub, all uh, right, and you want to change it to another name, it's very simple. There's an application online. You fill it all out. You present it to the board. Uh, you, go to the, you go to the city clerk's office. You get a new business certificate with the DBA on it. You are completed on it. Local board approves it. The ABC approves it. The new name goes into play. So it's important. We see a lot of these. This leads to a violation. We don't want to see that happen to you. Next thing, change of office, directors, trustees. That happens a lot. Same thing with clubs. Every year you have a new, you have a new vote of office and directors. You have to file an application every year on that. Because once they get approved from the local board and from the ABC, those people have the right to make decisions at the premises. So if you bring me in as the president and I don't get vetted or, uh, or an application is not approved with my name as the president, I have no authority to sign an application. I have no authority to sign checks or anything because you're not been vetted out. Moving along, renovation, alterations of premises. This is important as uh, uh, Deputy Chief Williams talked about and also the head of inspectional services talked about. You must get approved. And I tell everybody in advance, before you decide to go and remodel, go talk to the building department. Tell them what you're gonna do, tell them what it is, they'll work you through the process, all right? And when I talk about the process, we're talking about the process of getting the formal construction plans approved, making sure that you're in line with all of the guidelines from the fire department, building department, inspectional services. Get all that in advance. Once you have that, the process will move very slowly. Uh, move very, very slowly through the application process. And what I mean by slowly is the local board's gonna, they're gonna take that application, they're gonna ask you all these questions that I just stated about now. Did you go to the building department? Did you get all this done? Do you have plans on this laid out? Architectural plans, everything you will need, you wanna have that in advance. When it goes to the local board, all right, once they approve it, it comes to the ABC, we're gonna look for all that. We're gonna look for the plans, we're gonna make sure they're in compliance they, uh, to any type of alteration of premises guidelines, and then we come and do an on-site to make sure what you are saying is what is happening on these plans. Now, if you're building a hotel, you're building a building, we also do pre-construction approval. We know it's tough that we will not see the, the overall uh, finished product, but we will approve according to pre-construction. But the liquor license will not be issued until the inspectional services, building department, and fire safety sign off for you to take possession of the a license, yes. So it sounds to me like you're requiring that the building permit be issued first, right? We're not requiring it, but a lot of boards do. A lot of boards want the building the permit issued first. The other time is some, some uh, uh, municipalities let the application go through because they won't start construction until the ABC and the local board approve it at that point. So it's an option of the boards, whatever you want to do, or the building departments. Uh, and just to be clear, if you, if you do acquire a building permit through both the fire and, and building, uh, you still are subject to um, approval from the ABCC and the Liquor Commission. And if you proceed with construction, you're doing it at risk. Just so you know. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and you don't want to have all the construction all done, and then you go to the building department, and then what do you have? You have to take it all down. Because they will not, they're not going to take it upon your goodwill saying, oh, yeah, the electric, electrical was done right, the plumbing was done right. Uh, it's not going to happen that way. So we've seen a lot of tear outs happen along the way. So you want to make sure you're on top of it. Next thing, moving down, change your manager. 
Here's what I want to clear a fallacy that's out there. All right, if a manager somehow decides to quit or you have to let them go or uh, they decide to move on to another venture, that license does not shut down. Does everybody understand that? We get calls all the time from a disgruntled employee saying, I'm no longer the manager, go down there and close them down. It doesn't work that way. A licensed manager cannot hold the licensed premises hostage. Everybody understand that? So, what we're asking for is communication. So if at the last minute somebody walks out or so we have people that are deceased or suddenly pass away, there's, we don't want to jeopardize the business. We don't want you to have to shut down because you shut down, you're going to lose your, your staff and never mind the monetary uh, acknowledgement you're going to see out of that. What we're saying is this. If you have to dismiss a manager or the manager decides to quit, you want to communicate immediately with the local board. You want to say, listen, Ralph Sacramone is no longer the manager. We're actively looking to get a manager in. Any officer, director, stockholder, LLC manager or member can assume that role temporarily till you find someone. Now the communication starts. That's the key. Now when we say ample time, some people can do it in 14 days. Some people can do it in 30 days. We're not talking about a year. Places cannot run for a year without a manager. We're talking about do your due diligence and get it in. There's a lot of violations we see. We walk out, my ABC investigators walk into a place at 9 o'clock at night, ask to see the manager. This person comes up to them, says, I'm the manager. Everything is electronic now. My investigators go and look in and says, Ralph Sacramone, you're not the manager. All right, the manager is Ed Williams. Well, Ed hasn't been here for two years. Okay, the red flag goes up. So who's been running the facility for two years? Well, I've been. You've never been approved. That's a violation. We don't want to see that happen. Does everybody understand that? And remember, you're not held hostage if you are an owner. You can assume the role, but you want to communicate it immediately with the uh, Brockton board. Change of hours, what you apply for is the only hours you can operate. So if you're applied to work from Monday through Saturday and you're closed on Sundays, then business is good and you decide on Sunday you want to open, you have to get permission from the local board. You have to go in and say, file an application to open on Sunday and get approved on the hours. All right, you can just not take it upon yourself. Now, when we talk about licensees, I have a seven days a week, they're open from noontime till two o'clock in the morning or noontime to, to 1 a.m. Uh, those are your hours of operation. You should be operating those hours. Now, if it's a bad snowstorm, okay, and if the weather's bad or whatever's going on, you decide to close early. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people that approve seven days a week and decide only to operate Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's a violation. And if you want to only operate Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you have to do a change of hours, bring it to the local board, and it's up to their discretion if they're going to allow you. Because they're not going to give up a seven-day license for some, a seven-day liquor, all-alcohol license for someone to operate three days a week. They may say there's no public need for you to operate three days a week. So it's important that any type of change of hours, you go in and, and file them. Now, one good thing about the change of hours, it's expedited. As soon as the local board approves them, you can go in and effect right away. You don't have to wait for an approval from the ABC. The local board sends it to us. We acknowledge it right away. It goes right in the file. So when my investigators come in, they understand that you're allowed, you used to close at one, now you're allowed to open to two. All of that is in change. The local board will issue you a amended hard copy license with your new hours on it. Does everybody understand on it? We made it as simple as possible for you to do. And the last thing is change of location. All right, this goes along with alteration of premises. Your business is doing good. You're at three Main Street. You want to expand to five Main Street, which is next door and do an alteration of premises. That's great. We like to see people be prosper, but you cannot move in until you cannot expand and go into five Main Street from three Main Street until you do the due diligence. You're talking about getting your building permits, you're getting uh, approval at the local board, the ABC approval, upon you getting that application, that hard copy license, excuse me, then you can move in to that new premises. Everybody understand that? We run into this all the time with violations, is that people go through the first step. They go bring all the permits and everything to the local board. The local board approves it. The next night, they're serving over there. It doesn't work that way. You have to go do the three-step. We send out an investigator. An investigator will review that premises and make sure that it's in compliance to our extension guidelines. Also, the same thing goes for outdoor seating. 
All right? You get approved at the local board. You get approved uh, by the ABC. Once the local board issues you the amended license, that means all the certificates are in fire safety. Building department is all there. The local board will issue the amended license. Then you have authority to serve alcohol outside. Now, can you go... A lot of people go and do the construction ahead of time. They get outside seating all ready to go. They go to the local board and they ask for to add the ability to serve alcohol. You go through the three-step process and everything. In the meantime, you can ask for permission from the local board if you just want to serve food out there. That will be under your common VIC license. If you want to start serving food out there, that's okay. But alcohol cannot happen until the three-step approval is done. Any questions? Those are the most common mistakes we see at all times. All right, so we don't want you seeing any trouble. All of this is based on it. We're going to show you in a few minutes on the website where you can find all these applications and make it very simple for you. Any questions? I got one. Yes. This change of manager, right? What if you can't find anybody? Then you become the manager. Yeah, but I am the manager, but I'm, I want to get out. What if you can't find anybody? Well, Look they're all felons. <laughs> It looks like you can't leave then. <laughs> no, but the answer is, I know that there is a shortage of staff, and we understand no, that. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, a license is a privilege and responsibility. Responsibility is, once you take upon that license, you have to make sure there's a manager in place. So I don't know what to tell you, like how long you would stay there, but you would want to communicate immediately to the board if your manager left and you're actively well, seeking still someone. Right now, now since October, but I'm still, it's still on my name. Mm. I don't know what to tell you, but we're just telling you to create the communication. So you're acting manager right now? Well, I didn't think I was laughing right now. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so you, if it's still in your name until you find someone, you're totally lawful right now. This is prohibited what the action is, all right? Because it's not a vacant spot because it's under your name at this point. So there's no violation, all right? The question is the time frame. It's trying to find somebody. Here's what it was the opposite way. Say your manager leaves and you don't say anything to the board. And then the, the, uh, someone from the uh, well. Brockton Police Department come in want to speak to the manager, and this person says, I'm the manager, but you would never approve. There's where the violation is. Any questions on that? Yes. Does the manager have to be on the premise during the work hours all day? Or let's say the manager works four hours and leaves and comes back? And all right, the question was, does the manager have to be on the premises all day? No, it's impossible for that to happen. So if you're open from 12 to 12 or 11, 11 a.m. to 1 in the morning, the person does not have to be there. A majority of the time, the person should. All right, he should be running the day-to-day -day affairs. But if, they're gonna, if, they, if the manager is going to take off, just say Monday, and then work Tuesday through Saturday or Tuesday through Sunday, that's permissible. Can you appoint an assistant manager? Internally, you can, but you don't need to inform the local board on the, uh, you don't need approval for assistant manager. You can take that upon yourself. All right, to put a system manager, because we don't, if you're open 12, 15 hours a day, it's almost impossible to have a manager there. That's why places have supervisors and so forth. You can appoint them, but a manager should be overseeing the entire operation. That's ordering of alcohol, that's uh, controlling the service of alcohol, and controlling the license premises. Any questions on that? All right, I want to give a quick update to the outdoor patio. As everyone knows, before the pandemic took place back in 2020, all right, and the complete shutdown was, in order to do outside seating, you had to go through the three-step approval process. You'd have to apply to the local board. Uh, they would approve it. ABC would approve it. The local board would issue you the amended license, along with the building department, fire safety, and everybody signing off on it. Back in, uh, I think it was June, if I remember right now, June 10, 2020, the, the uh, Emergency order went to place where the legislators and the governor signed into order a streamline because we we're trying to get everybody open as much as, as quick as possible. Because you know right now when you go through a regular process, it takes you about four weeks through the local board, four weeks through the ABC, so it was an eight-week process. So back in June where everybody was shut down and no one could operate and then they allowed for outdoor seating, we did an express renewal where the local board really did all the approval of it. 
all right? And that temporarily, that order went out. Then it was extended all the way to uh, April 1st of 2024. Now there are two, just to give everybody an update, there are two bills pending up there right now. One to extend it for another year, because cities and towns, especially towns, need to work out a lot of problems. They have, they only meet once a year, so they have to work out ADA problems, they have to work out water, runoff problems and all of that, so uh, they have extended over a period of time. Now there's a, there is one out there to permanently approve the process. All right, so I don't know which one is going to do, move forward. It's a short period of time right now between now and April 1st. I would most likely say you will see a, the worst of all would be an extension of this order for another year. The best would be uh, that they, the uh, governor's office and legislators will approve a permanent outdoor seating uh, moving forward in the process. But one key thing to remember, you must control the premises. So as soon as people get outside, you want to make talk about it, the area is delineated so people know where they can consume the alcohol and where they cannot. That's why we require fencing or we require planters, bushes, chains, whatever way you do it, and it's up to you to control it. You still need to meet the fire and inspectional services guidelines for exits and entrances. Everybody understand that? You can't box anybody in with Jersey barriers and there's no way to get out if there is an emergency. So you still got to make sure you work with your police department, fire department, and inspectional services to control that premises. Now, a lot of these outdoor seatings are in neighborhoods. So local boards put additional conditions on the license that you may not be able to stay open to 2 o'clock outside. They control up to 11 p.m., all right, because you do not want to affect, your license does not want to affect the neighborhood's environment so all these rules that stay into effect and remember it's up to you to control the premises now some cities and towns have, have, have granted permission for licensees to walk over sidewalks with alcohol to like a grass area out in front of their facility or grass area connected their facility but they needed to walk on public space they granted permission on that for the employee to carry alcohol through that sidewalk area or that public space to a private spot or a public land that they're allowing you to be on. Remember the rules now, whatever you've been approved for, it's saying employees are the only ones that can transport over, customers cannot. Once customers get it, they have to consume that alcohol in the outside area. Any questions at all on this? Just, just wanted to add a comment to uh, Ralph, um, is um, the city of Brockton does not have an outdoor dining ordinance per se, okay? Uh, if you have private property and you want to establish an outdoor seating requirement, of course, first it would have to go through the licensing commission, but also, too, is it would be requirements of the site plan. And if, if you had, let's say you had enough, you know, area or in your property to be able to do it, then again, that would require a building permit and you have to go through the so, Chief? If we have a business in town, or is my union hall, for example, we have a liquor license for the union hall, and we want to hold a motorcycle on uh, run. We can get a one-day permit, even though we own, we have a liquor license in the building, we can get a one-day permit to have a function in the parking lot. Is that correct? That is correct. So what, just so if anybody in here is, say, for instance, you have this, this premises is licensed right now, but we want to do a big Oktoberfest or a, a, a Halloween run with motorcycles, or you want to have a big event set up side, outside with, with tents and everything like that, you can get a one-day license for that event. You go to the local board, it's up to their discretion if they're going to allow it. If they feel there's a public need for that, you will get approved by the local board. But one thing to remember, that's treated as a separate licensed premises. You cannot take alcohol from the inside and bring it outside. So if you're drinking inside, you have to have security in place to stop people from leaving inside with alcohol to outside. And the exact same rule goes for outside. So if outside you're doing a beer festival, all that beer is sold and maintained in that area. It's up to you to control it. All right, because if there is ends up an issue where the police are summons in and it is alcohol outside the area, you are responsible. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, you just say that there's two bills that are um, under consideration right now. One essentially to extend the temporary and one for more permanent, correct? Yep. Um, I know you said that the, at the local level is where a lot of it was getting determined. Is the local municipality about 
Yes, it is. Okay. The question came up is, if outdoor seating is allowed, uh, uh, temporarily expanded for another year or permanently uh, approved to stay in place, it's, the question is, does the local licensing authority have authority to issue it or not issue it? It is correct. The law is going to, either one of these laws, it's up to the, the, what we refer to as public need. If the local board feels there's public need for that licensee to extend. All right. So if they if they do move forward and say you're granted, there's a whole set of guidelines that the ABC put out. You'll find on the website for outdoor seating. If they deny you, okay, at this point in time you are denied. There's no appeal process to the ABC at this point. Under the temporary order, will there be in, will there be one the final order? I don't know if that's going to be in it. But right now it's full jurisdiction of the local board to allow the temporary order to move forward. Yeah, correct. Yes, it's full discretion. It's full discretion of the of the local uh, municipality on that. Someone else, I saw a hand up over here. Yes. So this covers alcohol um, outdoors. Uh, so if you're having an event outside uh, that's not serving alcohol, does this fall under the statute as well? No, it does not. Event outside of this with this this statute only concerned with alcohol service. It's the selling and sale of it. If you're moving to the outside, you would probably want to, uh, that might be affected under your occupancy permit or whatever you're gonna do. You may want to get together. That's one of the questions said, bring it to the building department in advance, what you're gonna do, and to see if it's, if it's zoned properly for that to happen. Any other questions? All right, at this point in time, this is a new slide we added in to here, this is everything I talked about, you can find this on our website. We have made our website very user friendly. It'll show you the process, how to find applications for new and used, for new or transfer license, also for amended applications and so forth, our commission advisories, commission decisions, and frequently asked questions. So the first thing I want to talk about is that first page I went over with all the changes, change your manager, all the, these applications that you're going to do, you are all active licensees. So if you were to click on, if we go to applications, if you were to click on to our website, we're doing it right now, you get, you will get to our homepage. Yeah, we got it. Here we go. Here's our home page. You will page down till you see this bar. What would you like to do? It gives you three. It gives you two choices here involved with licensing. One is uh, alcoholic beverage state license. Nobody here is a state license holder, unless you are a farmer, winery, brewery, or distillery. All right. Everybody else in this room, package stores, restaurants, hotels, uh, fraternal organizations, community care, retirement communities, you're all alcoholic beverage retail license. You will click on to that box and it gives you two choices here to do. You're going to apply for a new or transfer license or what everybody will select here is amend your license. When you click onto it, it gives you a list of all those things I talked about. And what's great about this right here, every one of these you click on, it will give you all the requirements. It's a full checklist where you will, where you will basically find everything you will need to be successful. So if you click on a change your manager, it tells you all the description, what you need. You click on to that, it's the actual application. All the documents, everything right down the line, how do you apply for a fee? Here's the checklist, everything. We make it successful for you. Here's where we find that people drop the ball. They don't read the checklist. They bring something to Sylvia and it's incomplete. How can Sylvia present that to the licensing board to vote upon if it's incomplete? All right, so what we do is Sylvia may say to you, this is incomplete. Most of the people take it back. Some people will not take it back. 
They said, up, forward this to the commission. So when it gets to the commission, the commission is going to say it's incomplete. We can't vote on it. So they're either going to table it or deny it. Save yourself. Look at exactly what you need. Make sure all of that is there, your payment receipt and the full completed application. Submit all those documents to Sylvia in one manner. The process will flow a lot quicker. Any questions at all? Every single transaction we talked about has this page to it. It tells you everything you need to be successful. Any questions at all on that? Uh, go back to the home page, Kyle. All right, on our home page, you page down. Another great tool we have over here is frequently asked questions. ABC has put them in 12 different languages. If you click on it, you see every type of language there. This is a great training tool. Utilize it. Everything you can think about from an on-premise license to a package store to a farm, a winery, brewery, distillery, all of that is in there, every single question. Because know what we have found is this. A lot of owners, when is the time for you to go research a project is after you close. So it's what, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, you're on the website. We put this tool in there to help you find everything you will need. If you click on the FAQs for English, all right, it breaks it down by category. Retail license is everything you can think of with the most common questions presented to the ABC at these events and from our calls we receive at the office, lists all of the questions and answers for you. So it puts it right there and it tells you what you need. This is a great training tool to also use for your staff. All right, when someone's arguing with you about, oh, you can do this, you can do that, all you gotta do is take it right to the question, the answer's right there. Any questions on the frequently asked questions? All right, uh, Kyle, if we jump to uh, the more actions and services, if you look over here, ABC Publications. If you wanna find out the guidelines to outdoor seating, you click on ABC Publications. You go to Commission Advisories, they're broken down by year, then we even break it down by title for each one. Everything you could click on right there, there's the advisory guide and outdoor uh, service. You click on that, you'll find everything you need of any type of advisory that the ABC has issued. And we, it goes all the way back to 2008. So if you're thinking about something in the past and you remember an advisory, everything you will find there. Here's all the guidelines for outdoor seating. It's simple right there. How do we get these guidelines? We put all, this, all the stockholders or all the stakeholders into one room. And we say, what problems did we run into? We had mayors, we had community development people, we had licensing board members, we had chairmen of commissions, uh, we had licensees, everybody could think of it. This is how the guidelines we came up with. And then the commission had a public meeting to approve them. So everything out here works. Follow these, you'll have no problem at all. Any questions on that? And then if you jump back over here, you see commission decisions. And we get a lot of calls on this. They'll say, oh, listen, I, I had a, the Brockton Police Department found a minor in possession at uh, my facility. They are charging me. What could happen? We tell you to go look. Click right onto this. There's examples of how uh, other licensees have, have, have uh, uh, issues with what you would see. If you had an underage person in there, you were selling to a minor, all of these things different. It's broken down by all the different cities, uh, all the municipalities throughout it. You remember now, this is a good tool you have if you see a, a projected problems. If you're meeting with your staff and say, look it, this is how important it is to check IDs. If not, this is what could happen. Some licensees, depending on their past history, have received 30 day suspensions. Chief Williams went over the entire policies and procedures. It's in writing what the Brockton Board approved at a public meeting. It's telling you, if you do this, you're going to get a seven day suspension or we're going to roll back your hours. So all of this you'll find all the way back to any type of decision on that. Any questions? Oh, we go back to the presentation now, thank you. The next thing I wanna talk about is a big fallacy that's out there about alcohol. And where do you purchase alcohol from? All right, under chapter 138, which is the Liquor Control Act, all right, all alcohol has to be purchased from an authorized source. Any licensee in Massachusetts, if you are a package store, if you are a restaurant, a hotel, uh, you will go to, I think it's slide number six. It 
here we go. Oh, right there. All right, purchasing an alcohol from an authorized source. What's an authorized source? I'm going to define it for you. Any Massachusetts wholesaler, any Massachusetts manufacturer. Those are the only entities you can purchase alcohol from. Everybody understand that? If you're a licensee, we talked about license. A license is a privilege and not a guarantee. This is one of the guidelines you must follow. So when we talk about Horizon, we talk about Minetti's, we talk about Night Shift Brewing, all of them are authorized either wholesalers or manufacturers. All right? If you go to Costco and you go to BJ's and you buy alcohol for them, that's a violation. They are not authorized wholesalers. They are nothing more than a big box store, package store. That's all they are. And we find the same problem out there. So Costco, Sam's Clubs, uh, BJ's, they are nothing more than package stores. You cannot buy your alcohol from them. All your alcohol comes from is the authorized source. If you want to know what the authorized source is, you can shoot us an email and we can give you a list of all the Massachusetts wholesalers and manufacturers out there that you need to purchase from. And the reason why I bring this up, it's more than ever the safety of the public. And you are responsible because you are delivering alcohol to an individual. There is a lot of black marketed product out there. Someone pulls up and we had this incident before. We got a lot of complaints from your competitors saying, hey, listen, this person is going to New Hampshire and buying alcohol. If you come here on a Thursday afternoon, you'll see his white van with this plate pull up and unload all this alcohol from New Hampshire. What do you think we do? We go there on a Thursday at that time and the complaint is exactly right. So listen what we do. We sit there and we observe you. Unload all that alcohol into your facility. Wait till you store it to put it away. Then we come in and we ask you, can we see the invoice for that order? All right? There's no invoice from Massachusetts Wholesale. Or the invoice you give to us is a New Hampshire liquor store. So this is what happens. All that cash that you paid up there, you can kiss that goodbye because we're going to confiscate the alcohol. We're going to bring it to our office. We store it as evidence. You're going to come in front of our commission for a hearing. And... I don't know how you're ever going to get away with it because the commission is going to find you a violation, a purchase from an unauthorized source. What happens at that point? We issue you a decision and you find a violation. You have 30 days to appeal. If you disagree with our decision, you can appeal to Superior Court. After the 30 days, you don't appeal. All that alcohol gets destroyed. You don't get it back. So the cash you put out plus the product, you lose it all. All right. So that's actually what we refer to the old term bootlegging. It's against the law. You can't, go to, you can't go to Rhode Island. You can't go to Connecticut. You can't go to Vermont. You can't go to Maine and buy that product. Because who's going to tell us? It's going to be your competitors. And that's where a lot of our complaints come from. And also we get complaints from the state police. Pulled over a van full of alcohol. First thing we ask them is ask them for their transportation permit. There's no transportation permit. Ask them for the bill of sale where it came from. The bill of sale is showing it's Connecticut. What happens next? They, they, they confiscate the entire load because it's an illegal bootleg and bring it into Massachusetts. All right, and that, if you're caught by the state police, that's a criminal offense. You're going to be charged. You're going to be going to court for that. All right, if we catch a licensee, we're charging you under Chapter 138, which your license is going to be on the line. Commission takes that very seriously. And then the last point we talked about bringing it from out of state is black market product. If someone pulls up to you and they say to you, hey, listen, I got five cases of Johnny Walker Black here, all right, we know what a case of Johnny Walker Black goes for. Give me $500, you can have all five cases. All right, off the bat, that should be a red flag right there. Second of all, you don't know if that's Johnny Walker Black in that bottle. If anybody remembered, right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, out in the Caribbean, some pirated alcohol got out there and people died. I think eight people died from it because you don't know what's in the bottle. So remember, any, remember one thing, you're serving that, and someone gets sick or someone dies from that, any good lawyer, as uh, Deputy Chief Edwards said, is going to bring it back to the source, and you're the source. All right? So never mind you're going to be charged uh, for uh, purchasing product from an unauthorized source. It's probably going to be a criminal charge. You're probably going to have a federal charge involved in that, too. So it's not worth it. And just remember, the deal, if the deal is good, it's probably a problem in there. And there's a lot of this going on. Does anybody have any questions on that? All right, the next thing, the next slide we're going to go to is a Section 12. Section 12, what that means is Chapter 138, Section 12. That's on-premise consumption. That's probably uh, 50, 60 percent of the people in the room, restaurants, bars, clubs, entertainment centers, GOPs. And then Section 15 is off-premise consumption. Those are your package stores. 
those uh, your gas stations, convenience stores, big box stores, Sam's Clubs, uh, BJ's, Costco, those are all there. One thing to remember, if you own multiple locations, you cannot transfer alcohol between each location. For some reason, there's a fallacy out there. If I own two package stores in Brockton, I have one on Main Street and one on Broadway, I can transfer alcohol back and forth. You do not. A license is site specific. All alcohol sold to one Main Street stays at one Main Street. The other one sold to 10 Broadway stays at 10 Broadway. You cannot transfer back and forth. That's a violation of the statute. Second of all, if you're using one store as a wholesale place and transferring to one of your other stores, it creates a double violation. The store that is transferring it is acting as a wholesaler. That's violation of Chapter 138. And then the person receiving it is going to, your other store is going to end up with a violation buying from an unauthorized source. So it's not worth it to do uh, whatever fallacies out there that you could transfer alcohol back and forth. That's not allowed. Second of all, too, if you get audited by the DOR, the DOR does a formula, very simple. They're going to go to that one main street, and they're going to say, let me see your invoices. You're going to give them your invoices. Then they check with each of those wholesalers that you did buy this product. Then they have a formula to say, okay, you brought this much product. This is how much profit you have. They look at your tax returns. If you're using that as a shipment center, and you're delivering to the other store, you're going to get hit with a tax you're never going to believe on because they're treating you as receiving all that product. So you're going to save yourself the big accounting headache and a lot of questions answered by the DOI. Does everybody understand that? So you're not authorized to do this. I don't want you to see you end up with a double violation because both your stores, the person selling it and the person, uh, the license he's selling it, the license he's receiving, it ends up with a double violation. The next item is delivery of alcohol. Delivery of alcohol has always been allowed for a Section 15 package store. All right, remember as I said, package stores, uh, convenience stores, gas stations, big box stores, always had the ability to deliver directly to consumers' homes. All right, and all you had to do is come to the ABC, you got a delivery license, which is Chapter 138, Section 22. That's a transportation license, it's $150 for the entire year, and you can deliver anywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. If you're a Brockton package store, you can deliver anywhere you want, all right, with that one permit. But you gotta make sure you have that permit because if you're, if you're going out to deliver and the police pull you over, they're gonna ask you for the permit and the receipt. If you don't have that permit, they can confiscate all that product. So it's important, come to us. You can get these permits within 24 hours some days when you apply for the permit. So every Section 15 was allowed to it. During the pandemic, there was an emergency order put into place allowing Section 12s, which was restaurants, hotels, and uh, taverns and everything, the ability to deliver alcohol to consumers as long as it was with a meal. As everyone knows, the restaurant industry took a beating on-premise licensees took a beating during the pandemic. This was a way to try to let you generate some extra revenue. So this uh, takeout of alcohol is also set to expire on uh, April 1st, 2024. There's also two bills out there, one to extend it and one to make it permanent. But the permanent one just has is if it's the extended one, you have to serve it with a meal. Does everybody understand that? So, and there are, there are, uh, uh, Distinguished and on, on our uh, advisory, which anybody can take a look at, there were distinguished amounts that you could sell with each meal. So with each meal, you could sell up to 192 ounces of malt beverages. You could sell up to a liter and a half of wine or champagne. And you could sell up to uh, 64 ounces of mixed drinks in a sealed container. And what we mean by a sealed container, you can do anything you want in the container as long as there's not a spout in that container where someone can stick a, draw, a straw in it and... Uh, and get to that product before they get to their place of their location where they're going to consume it or anything. People use mason jars, they seal them up. This is very, very popular with Asian restaurants, with Mai Tais, uh, Mexican, Guatemalan, uh, Spanish restaurants, Mediterranean restaurants, with uh, daiquiris and margaritas, selling those mixed drinks to go where someone have to buy multiple, uh, multiple uh, types of alcohol to make them. So it is very good. All you want to do is very simple. Make sure... Your delivery people have the transportation permit. And with this case right here, uh, we have waived the transportation permit for the Section 12s. 
all right, to deliver. If you, uh, you want to make sure who's ever delivering for you, or if you are delivering, is that there is a, uh, some type of receipt showing that there was a meal purchase with that alcohol. Because if not, if you're, just if you're just delivering the alcohol from a restaurant, the police are going to confiscate it or the ABC is going to confiscate it. Also, another thing, third party carriers. Everybody knows who they are. They're Uber, DoorDash, Instacart. All of them are in the business of delivering your food and alcohol. Now, they are allowed to deliver for you. That's not a problem. You just want to make sure that third party carrier has a license. And that license is chapter 138, section 22. It's an express transportation permit. All you got to do is ask them to see that license. It will give you the name of the company. All right, and you want to make sure that each one of the deliveries they have have an invoice and you bring it to the consumer. The most important point that I can stress out of this is make sure that you have the ability to audit these people. And what I mean auditing for is checking IDs. As you check the ID at the brick and mortar location, the ID should be also checked, must be checked, when you are delivering to someone's home, to a consumer's home. The kids are smart, especially around college areas. They figured out what package stores were not checking IDs. And we had an issue up there in the Brighton area, Boston College. We got a call from the campus police saying we, we, we got a, a, a ton of intoxicated individuals there. We're trying to figure it out. So when my chief investigator was working through with them, what are you seeing? Well, we're seeing a lot of deliveries from this company, and I'll leave them nameless. And what happened was the Boston uh, College Police didn't even know that company was delivering alcohol because of their name. So they were delivering alcohol from package stores to people underage, and the, and the students were all texting each other, order from this package store, this delivery company doesn't check it. So we did a compliance check on them. What a compliance check is, we put an underage person at a dormitory, and we had uh, alcohol delivered to them. Or we followed their vehicles, and we found them delivering to people underage. We did 19 compliance checks. How many do you think they failed? How about all 19? And the commission took it seriously. They revoked that license. All right? And then if something had happened, remember one thing. You're, you authorize them to deliver for you. All right? And any good attorney, if someone gets hurt with that alcohol, they're going to follow it all the way back to the original source. So it's a good thing. Just like you check IDs at the brick and mortar, at the restaurant, or at the counter, you want to make sure your delivery people who work for you or the third parties are doing the exact same thing and you need to audit them. Any questions on that? And I will put everybody on notice, as Kyle will talk to you shortly about compliance checks, is that we are performing compliance checks on deliveries. So just to let everybody a heads up on it. Yes, sir. Oh, you want to see their policy and procedures. They all have these policy and procedures saying we do this. So they, some of them take pictures of the IDs. Some people download them to a scanner. That's what you want to be able to check on that you know it's happening. So you will be able to audit them. If they don't have an audit procedure in place, don't do business with them. Tell you right out the bat because that means they're not going to be a good, they're not going to be a good venue for you to protect your alcohol. Yes. Well, the direct fault is going to go to the delivery company right off the bat. But remember, as like Chief Williams said in that nightclub fire, or in that, oh no, excuse me, the other scenario he used about one of the egresses, there was no second egress, everybody that did work or everybody that touched that facility end up down the line getting sued. Any good attorney is going to bring it back to yourself. So the question is, yes, it's the person delivering it, but you're giving them authorization to deliver your alcohol. So you want to make sure you can check it. And a lot of them right now, since that decision of revoking that license, a lot have come into policy and procedures in place with scanning, with taking pictures of IDs and so forth. So it's important. We're telling you, I'm telling you this up front, protect yourselves. If they tell you they audit and you can check on it, check to make sure that is there. It's only going to save you a headache in the long run. 
If you're pushing your clerks at your counter and your serving staff to check everybody's ID, you don't want to have exposure on app product being delivered to homes. Any questions on that? All right, the next part of the presentation I'm going to turn over to our, our general counsel, Carl Gill. Uh, just to give you a quick history about Carl Gill, uh, Carl entered the ABC as our first associate general counsel. If any of you has got, if any of you has had any violations, he was the prosecuting officer for the investigators. So if you, you saw his face, usually means you were in trouble. But Kyle is now reported to our uh, general counsel. He's going to cover the next part of the presentation. Kyle. Thank you, Ralph, and thank you everyone for attending this morning. Um, again, as Ralph mentioned, my name is Kyle Gill. I'm general counsel at the ABCC. And the first slide I'll be speaking about is compliance checks, specifically ABCC compliance checks. They are, we are advertised and are performing them in 2024. For my recollection, Boston, uh, Brockton was not, um, there were no compliance checks done by the ABCC in Brockton last year, from my recollection. So they, they may, may very well um, be testing your establishment soon. What, what our ABCC investigators do, they'll assign a day for all of Brockton, they'll have an underage operative working with them, and they'll do all the package stores and all the on-premises licenses in the municipality, and they'll test them all. Now, the way you pass a compliance check, it's, it's easier than um, running your business in general, because all you have to do is ask them for an identification. Our um, underage operatives do not provide a false identification. They don't tell you they left their ID in their car. They will turn around and walk out the establishment. So that's how you pass an ABCC compliance check. You ask for an identification. Um, as Ralph mentioned, we're not just doing um, compliance checks on premises anymore. We are testing the delivery companies as well. So if you do use a delivery company, as Ralph mentioned, make sure they have their policies and procedures, make sure you may even want to test them yourself. Um, th th that's a good way of doing it too, but they will be tested as well, and um, they'll, be, they'll be found in violation if they, if they serve to a um, minor without IDing them at all. Um, move on to the next slide, which I have here. So these are, now again, I mentioned they're all not that easy because when they're not a compliance check, you might have an underage presenting you what's not their identification or a false identification. So in Massachusetts, there are still only six acceptable forms of identification. It's a Massachusetts driver's license, a Massachusetts liquor ID card, a Massachusetts um, identification card, a United States passport or a passport recognized by the United States government, a United States passport card or a military ID. And what do I mean by acceptable? Um, it's not that they're the only type that accepted, it's that you can reasonably rely on these. And what does that mean? It means that if it's not one of those IDs, you can't reasonably rely on it. Um, reasonable reliance isn't absolute. If someone gives you a Massachusetts driver's license and it looks nothing like the person on the ID as the person in front of you, that's not reasonable. If someone who clearly looks like they're 16 years old comes in with a license that's saying they're 25, that's not reasonable. So just because they give you a Massachusetts driver's license, you can't, can't take it just, you still have to be reasonable and look at the person and, and make a judgment call. Where it can help you is, um, say if an uh, a underage 20-year-old uses their older brother's valid Massachusetts license. So, they show you their ID, they look alike, maybe they have similar height, same color eyes. You, you make a reasonable belief. You believe this is the person in front of you, you make the sale. There's an ABCC investigator or a Brockton police, um, Brockton police officer outside and they see the individual, they think they look young, they find out they're 20, they charge you with selling to a minor. You have a hearing in front of the Brockton License Commission you have a hearing in front of the ABCC, you have an affirmative defense. I reasonably relied on, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 136 and 34B, one of the identifications which I can reasonably rely on. It looked like the person, it was actually their older brother, they were the same height, I thought I was selling to them. Under those facts, I think you very well will be found not in violation under those facts. Um, now there is one type of identification that's not here that's, um, a lot of people talk about that's eight out-of-state identifications, out-of-state driver's licenses. You do accept them at their own your own risk. Now, if you accept a, some, a New Hampshire driver's license and the person is 
22 years old and they're actually 22 years old and it's a real driver's license and you serve to them, that's not a violation. You can accept them. It's only a violation when they're not 21, when they're, when they're under 21. Um, so just in summary, you do um, accept the out-of-state of your own risk, out-of-state licenses, and as there is right now, like many things, there is pending legislation to actually include out-of-state driver's licenses with the same protection as Massachusetts driver's license, but that has not um, come to fruition yet. That has not been passed by the legislature or signed by the governor yet, but it is pending, um, and I think it was even reported, reported as favorable. Um, does anyone have any questions on identifications or compliance checks? Okay, I'll move on. Okay, the last place of drink, and this is what's co commonly referred to as the 24J report. So, in the Commonwealth, if someone um, is convicted or pleads guilty to operating under the influence of alcohol, they are asked by the clerk magistrate at their sentencing, um, where was the last place they had a drink? Um, if they name your establishment or if they name your establishment, what you get to receive in the mail along, we receive the same thing, the Attorney General's office and the District Attorney's office, is a notice saying that you were named as the last place to drink subject to an OUI. Now, this piece of paper is not in and of itself a violation. Um, and to be completely honest, we have found that they're not the most reliable either, but they are tracked. Our chief investigator does track them, and once he sees that there's a pattern, now this establishment has two, three, a half a dozen, what he's going to do is he's going to send an underage operative onto your, um, no, sorry, he's going to send an ABCC investigator onto your premise. They're going to be undercover. They're, they'll even order a drink. They'll be sitting at the bar. And what they're going to be looking for is people showing signs of intoxication on your premises. And they're going to see if they get served after. Because that's where the violation is. To be found in violation of selling to an intoxicated person, three things have to happen. There has to be an intoxicated person on your premises. Your employees or yourself had to have known or reasonably known that they were intoxicated. And then after that, there's the delivery of alcohol. So if a person's acting loud and obnoxious, they're stumbling, they're not, um, they, they, maybe they're picking fights with people, um, slurring their words, smell very strongly of alcohol. Um, those are signs of intoxication that are gonna be noted by an investigator. And then if they're served thereafter, that's where the violation happens. Um, and obviously, it has been speak, spoke about earlier, you do, the licensees do have a duty to protect your patrons from foreseeable harm. So you can see how if someone served a drink when they were intoxicated, something happens later, an attorney's gonna go back to the source. So that's a common theme on today. Um, does anyone have any questions on the 24J report? Okay, move on. Hours of operation. Now I know we spoke, uh, I believe it was Deputy Chief Williams spoke this earlier, there are, municipalities vary on their specific rules for last call. In general, statewide, you can't utilize your alcohol license um, beyond what you're approved for, before or beyond. Um, I know there are some specific details um, shared today, um, and that's specific to the city of Brockton. So, the ABCC and the city of uh, Brockton, most likely the Bo Brockton Police, they're authorized agents of the local licensing authority, and they are, they are applicable to what's called Massachusetts General Law Chapter 138, Section 63A, and that's a criminal statute which, for, which doesn't allow anyone to hinder um, an ABCC investigator or a local police department when they're investigating a licensed premises. Um, it's a criminal statute. Um, we don't charge it criminally. We charge it... Um, at the, at the commission level, but when there is a violation, it is treated very seriously. Examples of violating this are locking um, an ABCC investigator or a Brockton police officer out of your premises, um, closing a door, not letting them in, or locking a, a door, a room that's on the premises with, within your premises and not letting them in, physically obstructing an ABCC investigator or, or a um, Brockton police officer. Or uh, another common one is it also requires you to give documents um, that may be, that they can use to investigate and enforce the chapter. So if you have surveillance and you delete it or intentionally destroy it, it's another example where you can be charged with a violation of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 138, Section 63A. 
And I know there's a misnomer out there, um, and I know people spend a lot of time in their businesses, a lot of maybe even more time than their own house. But unlike your house, the ABCC investigator, Brockton police, do they do not need a warrant to enter your licensed premises. Um, it's, it's different than your home. Does anyone have any questions on, on this issue? Does not look like it. Here are some other issues um, I think the, the local board might have wanted to talk about, but I'll skip for now. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Executive Director Ralph Sacramoni again. Thank you all for your attention um, this morning and now maybe early afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. To the next slide up on the board, I want to clear some fallacies up about a club license. All right. As club license, master under law, section 12, it's on-premise consumption. A club license is not open 24 hours a day as people think they are. A club is for members and guests of members. You cannot run it like a for-profit entity, like a restaurant, and you're advertising the newspapers, we got this band coming on this night, we're having an Oktoberfest. That is not what a club license is about. We always save this to keep it uh, separate from the other license. As a club license, they're fraternal organizations. All right, they're the Saints operations, they're veterans clubs. All of these are for members and guests of members. When getting approved for these, a local licensing authority can put any condition they feel is necessary requiring you to, for, for example, is that any guests that are on the premises have to sign in on a book. The guest has to leave with a member that comes on. A guest could only come there six times a month before they were required to join that organization. We have clubs that think they're outside of the law. There is no alcohol in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that can be served between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m., except for three facilities, and all of those are under casino license to 4 a.m., all right? When you are issued a club license from the city of Brockton and from the ABC, you follow the exact same guidelines as every other licensee. That includes closing times, that includes no one under the age of 21 consuming or being in possession of alcohol. All of that is important. You want to make sure you're not leading yourself down a bad road here because we have a lot of clubs that are trying to operate as a, a nightclub and a general on-premises where you're not set up to do that. Your corporate articles or the articles you set up as a non-profit organization. So when you set up that way, those are the rules you must follow. Same thing with purchasing alcohol. All alcohol for a club has to be purchased from the authorized source, either a Massachusetts wholesaler or a uh, Massachusetts manufacturer. So if anything has been going on before this, consider it the past and you need to move forward on this. Because you got to remember, you are under more strict guidelines as a club than any other licensee is because of the additional conditions that the uh, local licensing authorities can place on that license. Does everybody understand that? If you go and you look up, a, if you go up and you look at the statue involving Section 12 clubs, you can't even have a Budweiser sign in your window or one of the neon lights in your window. All of that goes away. Now, can you do fundraising? Yes, you can. You get permission from the local board to do fundraising. There's no problem at all. All that money goes to the club, the nonprofit organization. All right, there's not a problem. Some, some clubs like the Knights of Columbus, the Elks, the Moose, the Veterans Clubs, they have function halls. That's okay. You get permission. That's how you would run it that way. Now, do those events only can be to members and guests of members unless you get permission from the local licensing authority that you can use those as fundraising events, membership drives, or all of the revenue goes to the club, there's where the function halls can run. The key thing here is communication. You want to make sure you're doing what is right on that. Any questions on clubs? Remember, every year I know clubs have, they have their election of offices. When your offices change, you've got to file the change of officer and director's application. You've got to make sure your taxes are current because that's going to require Department of Revenue, Department of Unemployment Assistance, and so forth. That's what you'll need on that. Any questions on clubs? All right. The big thing we have here is working together. We want all the departments to work together with the police department, with the fire inspectional services, with uh, ISD, and also the billing department. The big thing you want to do is, like, it's all communication, and you have 
the duty to protect your customers and your patrons. So for instance, if you, if you see two individuals starting to get anxious with each other and you call the Brockton police to come down, you are foreseeing trouble, you're not gonna be penalized for that, all right? And you can't be responsible for somebody throwing a sucker punch at someone else because you did not foresee it. Where are you responsible if those two people start arguing and you push them outside to fight? Then when the Brockton police are gonna come, they're gonna charge you because that started on the inside and you could have prevented that. And you gotta remember your neighbors and if someone else gets hurt outside in the street uh, that had nothing to do with your license premises, you're responsible too. You're responsible for the outside of your license premises when individuals leave. Now, don't take it in cement that when you call the local police or you call the Brockton Police Department preventing a problem, but if they get there and both of those individuals are intoxicated because you served them, you're gonna have a little headache, all right? Because you served both of those people, you got them into a toxicated state, but if you foresee problems, there's where you are required to seek assistance. Does everybody understand that? It's better to call and prevent it than from this escalating uh, to a, a level two or level three situation where someone's gonna get seriously hurt or someone get killed. Any questions on that? And the same thing goes with DIA, inspectional services, same thing goes with the fire department. If you think there is, you have any questions, you think you may not be doing something right, call them. You're not gonna get penalized, all right, if you call them looking for help. You're gonna get penalized when they walk in and you got egresses blocked or you have this situation going, that's totally different. If you need help, this is what we're talking about reaching out. Any questions at all on that? The next quick slide, this is not my department, this is another department we work as a liaison with. This is the uh, Department of Industrial Accidents. This, and the reason why we invite them to speak today and the gentleman had to cancel out, is this is about workman's comp. Everybody that has a license or a business required to, to carry workman's comp unless you're exempt. How do you know you're exempt? You go to this website and you call these people. They will help you out, and if you're not exempt, they'll tell you what you need to do, how to get insurance, and what you need on it. This is very important because these people have as much power as the fire chief and the police chief that can shut you down on site. A police chief can shut you down if he fears for life and property, same thing with the fire chief or the, or the deputy chief can shut you down the spot if they feel people's lives are at risk. And then workman's comp. You do not want to be working on a Friday night with a full restaurant and they come in and you don't have workman's comp insurance, they will shut you down on site. We don't want that to happen. If you, if you have any questions at all, you reach out to this website, give these people a call. They're very good at helping you out and walking you through the process. We're only telling you this now because I don't want to see you have a headache. And it happens all the time. Any questions? Yeah, I'm correct. You can't get a license for all the workers' comp. That's, that's correct. But there's people who let the workman's comp lapse. And then when the, and, and, and the insurance companies contact the DI. That's why I'm telling them just to make sure you keep everything current. Because you are down, and if you want to appeal, it's a 10 day waiting period, and you find $250 a day to your appeal. You could take the automatic shutdown, pay a fine, and get insurance the same day, you're back up and running the next day. But we see this all the time. Well, what I'm saying is you can't renew your license. You have to renew it every year. You can't renew it without them, without showing that. I, I agree with you. You're absolutely correct on it. But this is what happens after you renew, is when people let the policies lapse. And the insurance companies, and I let you know the insurance companies, they do send the Kens a lot of cancellation notices to the DIA. Let them know that this person doesn't have a lot of those because they may have changed carriers, but a lot that people let it lapse. Any questions? All right, at this point in time, I, I want to bring up uh, Tom Carroll. Tom's with the U.S. Department of Labor. He oversees, uh, he is the liaison person that does all of the seminars in reference to wage, hour, and also child labor. The reason why I want you to we, we asked Tom to come. When you see after his presentation, a lot of people have been doing things wrong over the years. This is your chance to straighten it out. Tom? Just at the end. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I know you guys are probably 
tired of information. This is real quick on my side, five to 10 minutes because you're overwhelmed with information and I think we all need a drink after all those laws. But, um, so my name is Tom Carroll. I work for US Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division. I was an investigator for 15 years. Now I do community outreach where I just educate the public on um, the most common mistakes that employers make and I just, uh, focus this on the restaurant industry. Usually we do like eight hour presentations or a week, but I'm just gonna point out a, f a few things or the common problems in the restaurant industry or hospitality. First, you have to realize that there's state laws and federal laws, so you have to comply with both state and federal regulations. There's a state department of labor and there's federal department of labor. In Massachusetts, federal minimum wage is 725, state is 15, so obviously whatever benefits the employee most is what you have to comply by. Um, in Massachusetts, you don't have to pay overtime to anyone working in hospitality, including restaurants. However, under federal law, you do. So there is an overtime requirement for anyone in the restaurant industry. Um, so for the part that we enforce Fair Labor Standards Act, there's four parts. There's minimum wage, overtime, record keeping, and child labor. I'm just gonna go over them quickly. So for minimum wage, obviously it's $15 an hour. There's that issue with tipped employees. When someone's a tipped employee, they they have to make under mass law a minimum of $6.75 an hour plus tips. Um, but if they work overtime, they are entitled to overtime rates. Uh, a lot of, most of the uh, restaurants are, make mistakes on this in that they do time and a half to 675 if a server or a tipped employee works overtime and that's incorrect. That server or any tipped employee is a minimum wage employee, so they have to be paid that $15 an hour. Um, so if they work overtime, and this is where it hurts the restaurants, is that they have to be paid time and a half to $15 or $22.50 plus tips, but the restaurant is taking a tip credit like they did for the first 40 hours, so they're only paying them $6.75, so they're taking a tip credit of $8.25 for the first 40 hours. They can use that same tip credit of $8.25 in overtime hours, so it, bottom line is if they work overtime, they have to be paid $14.25 an hour plus tips, and I know that, that hurts, but that's, that's the requirement. Um, tip pooling is a big question. Um, who can share the tips, it's only for tipped employees. However, you've, you may have seen that some states are, are making minimum wage of $15. They're trying to get rid of that tip credit, which there's a lot of pros and cons. But if that does happen in mass, or if you're paying your servers minimum wage and they're not, they're not, you're not taking a tip credit, you can use all of the tips in a tip pool that would include, excuse me, the, um, the kitchen staff as well. And that's why they're trying to say, well, if the restaurant is really busy and a server's making $300 that night and the, the kitchen is working like crazy and they're getting their same rate if it's slow or busy. So that's the, the thoughts behind sharing the tip pool with back of the house if the front of the house is making minimum wage. But we're not there yet, but I really think it's gonna happen in mass. Um, it, so a server or any tipped employees, they are considered minimum wage. They're probably making 30 bucks an hour with tips and everything, but they're still considered a minimum wage employee. So n there can be no deductions on that person. You can't, if the, uh, customers wor uh, walk out or they drop a plate of food or a wrong order, you, you can't deduct that from anyone's wages. That's, that's a violation because the, you would make them below minimum wage because they're a tipped employee only making 6.75 an hour. Um, that's a common fallacy that they can make deductions. Same thing with uniforms, shirts, all of that. There can be no deductions other than the standard deductions like taxes and all of that. Um, let me see. So child labor is, I'm going to go on a, on a screen or two. 14 and 15 year olds have a limited time of hours they can work per week, only 18 hours per week. Uh, you want to be careful with child labor. When we do cases and we find out that there were there was a violation of child labor, you do get fined. It's not a big fine, I mean it is, say like you know, 2,500 or 5,000, it's a pretty big fine. But if something happens to that minor while working in violation, that family's gonna sue you and you know, they're gonna take a million dollar lawsuit and take your business away. So just to be, to, to keep an eye on that is, is more important for yourself than being in violation of the law because if that child gets hurt, and they weren't supposed to be working after 9 p.m. or 7 p.m. that night, the, uh, they're gonna get an attorney, and the attorney's gonna say, well, you are unlawfully hiring this minor, and they're gonna sue you. So really be careful of that. 
uh, record keeping. You have to keep your records for three years with the Department of Labor. You have to keep a record of all hours worked and payroll records. That's what you need to do. So if I say, well, this person in 2022, did they work the week of July 17th? Yes, they did. How many hours? Yeah, I want to see the hours and the pay. Um, it's pretty basic for record keeping. But for the minimum wage, again, the most common violation is um, for, for tipped employees because you cannot make deductions from any of their wages because they're considered a minimum wage employee. And the other thing was the, the overtime for tipped employees, it is $14.25 per hour. Overtime pay, it's pretty basic, but we see a lot of instances where the back of the house are, are salaried employees. It's common that they'll get, say, $800 or $1,000 a week um, for line cooks or whatever, and they're salaried for that $1,000, but they're working 50 hours a week, so they're getting $20 an hour for their 50 hours. Um, they are not exempt from overtime because they're not ex in an executive exemption, meaning that if there's a kitchen manager, that person doesn't make overtime, but all the other workers in the kitchen are entitled to overtime. So in the example I gave, if, if a, an employee is making a $1,000 salary in the kitchen and working his 50 hours, that week he's going to be owed an extra $100 in overtime because he worked $10 of overtime at the rate of $20, so 10 times 10 is $100. And if we do a case and we find out that that person was paid for two or three years with that, it's going to cost you, you know, $10,000 for that employee. So just keep that in mind. The, the best advice I can give you is that, you know, you want to check who can I pay overtime, who I, just call us. We have a person Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, that answers the phone, a live person, uh, because they have a duty agent that answers the calls. I'm going to give you the number at the end, but it's an 866 number, and you put in your um, zip code, and you get forwarded to the office closest to you, and you can ask any question at all, and if they don't know the answer, they're going to get it to you within 24 hours. If they don't answer, which is that happens sometimes, they have to get back to you within the 24-hour time frame. So the big thing on overtime, make sure that if it's a salaried employee, that they're, they're still not exempt from overtime. Uh, it gets a little complicated, and that's why I can't get too in-depth with it, but the most common ones are back-of-the-house employees who are paid a salary that don't meet the duties of an of a overtime exemption. Uh, here's the 1425, the tipped employees, and here's the example I gave for the, the back-of-the-house employees. Um, another thing I want to point out at the bottom line here is that, you know, we see it right now a big influx of undocumented workers, and there's a lot of... Uh, companies that are taking advantage of that, they'll say, okay, I know you're illegal, I'm going to give you $12 an hour cash um, because uh, you're not going to be paid taxes, but it's the same if you are on the payroll. Nope, that's, you know, it's still the requirement of the $15 and they're still entitled to time and a half the hours over 40. A lot of workers will say, okay, I'll just get straight time and cash for the hours over 40 which may happen, but you have to realize that a lot of workers, when they leave their employment, they're like, oh, how can I get any money out of this past employer? And you'd be surprised, and they're going to call us and say, hey, I worked for this company for three years. I was paid cash. Um, I, I got minimum wage of $15, but when I worked overtime, I was paid $15 an hour in cash and straight the straight time rate. So we go there and we look at the records, and um, if they don't have records for, for cash employees, we take statements from those employees, and if the employer can't show the actual hours worked, we have to go with what the employee states. So it's going to come back and bite you, and that's why when you see all these cases where a restaurant has to pay $250,000, and you're like, what? Because well, you look at two years, and you look, okay, this person wasn't paid overtime. You know, it adds up if you have a, a 10, 15, 20 employees. So just be careful because it does come back. You think, oh, I have a good relationship with this employee. He's not going to rat me out. I'm paying him cash, but I'm not paying him overtime. Okay, everyone's happy. But then when they leave, they'll say, hey, I can get 20 grand if I call Department of Labor and we have to um, answer his complaint and look at the uh, details of the employer. So the child labor, again, the, the 14 and 15 year olds is where there's a limit that's 18 hours a, uh, a week. They can only work three hours a day on a school day, and it's only from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., so it's usually like between 3 and 7 where they work their three hours. Um, they're, they're getting strict on this because child labor is like the hot topic right now. But um, an example is the Dunkin' Donuts. Sometimes you see 14 and 15 year olds working and they'll work till 8 p.m. instead of 7 on a school night. That's a violation, and each day they do that, they get fined for each of those days. 
Um, if the school is not in session, they can work up to 40 hours a week if there's a vacation or in the summer. Also in the summer, they can work until 9 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. Meal uh, break periods. This is a little difficult in hospitality because you have servers that are doing roll-ups or chatting and talking, and they, don't, they say they don't get a break, but they, they have 10-minute breaks here, 15-minute breaks here. So if, if you deduct automatically 30 minutes from a person's time records for their uh, break, I would recommend that you have them punch out because if it's not documented, the employee is going to say, oh, I never got a break. I had to sweep the floors and, uh, you know, I, I had a sandwich, but I was answering the phone while I ate my sandwich. So if it's over 20 minutes and they're not doing anything, you can deduct that from the, from the payroll. You can say 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you took a, a break. Um, under mass law as well, I don't enforce that, but after six hours you have to offer 30 minutes um, break time for the employees. Misclassification, a lot of times you'll, an employer will try to save money and misclassify employees as independent contractors because independent contractors aren't, co aren't covered under the Fair Labor Standards Act. They're not required to be paid overtime. They don't have all the, um, the rights under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the um, employer will try to save some money because they'll say, okay, if they're an independent contract, I don't need to get workman's comp, I don't need an unemployment insurance, all of those, health insurance, overtime, even minimum wage because they're an independent contractor. But then when we go and have a case and we speak to the workers and say, who's your employer? They're going to say, well, you know, this restaurant or um, they told me to fill out a paperwork saying that I have um, John Smith's cooking something and, you know, I'm my own employer. And it doesn't fly. You know right away if someone's an employee or an independent contractor. Um, so be careful of that as well. And be careful if you use any third-party agencies, any temp agencies. You think you kind of get out of trouble if you say, you know what, I'm not involved in this. I don't want to ask if they have paperwork to work or any of that. I'm going to hire a temp agency to hire my employees. The, the temp agencies, some of them are really shady. I mean, they're in business for a year and they take off with all the money. But you're paying them, say, $16 an hour for the workers and they're telling them they're going to pay them $15 an hour and do all these requirements and then you find out that the temp agency is paying $10 an hour cash to the worker and then we find out about it so we do the whole case and we find out that the employer owes $100,000 in back wages to the employees and they'll say well they're not our employee that's the temp agency's employee and we'll say you're a joint employer, you're both responsible, then we try to reach out to the temp agency and they just vanish because their business address is out of a house or a one-door office and it's really shady out there and I wouldn't recommend doing any temp agencies in, in hospitality. Um, just to keep that in the back of your mind as well. So I hope oh, this is his, but I wanted to give you my contact number. It's not there though. Um, it's easy though, it's dol.gov, departmentoflabor.gov, and it's the same what Ralph had on the website. It has all the requirements of, of it's, there's so much law in it, but you can find your way, and if, if you have just a basic question or you don't want to read through all the law, just call us. Our number is 866-4-US-WAGE. I know I, I usually I have it up on the screen, but it's 8664 US wage, and it's on the paperwork I have out in the tables out front. But we'll, we're willing to answer any questions you have. You know, we, we want to just educate you, and you, you do get stuck. You think your, your employees are your family, but you, you realize once they leave, they don't care about you, and they're going to try to get money. And if you had a, a situation where you were both benefiting, and all of a sudden they're like throwing you under the bus, you're kind of screwed on that, so, so be careful on that. So I wanted to try to make it quick. I, the, w labor laws are so intense, there's like two-inch law books, et cetera, but I just wanted to give you a few tips on the hospitality industry, and uh, thank you for your time. Just want to thank everyone joining us, taking, again, time out of your day. Um, I just want to go over just a couple of things on the local side. As you can tell, we work with many partners um, around the city, fire, police, building, um, inspectional services, and obviously in lockstep with the ABCC, uh, as well as the law department. So, you know, we typically know what's going on. Um, a lot of people think that we don't know if someone's doing something, buying liquor, 
letting underage kids, you know, things take time, but typically we know when an establishment is, you know, trying to infringe on rules and breaking rules. Um, I'm just gonna have the deputy chief bring up the website. So we have a website at the Brockton License Commission. Um, again, we are a staff of one, uh, Sylvia Carvalho's here. Um, we ask that you email. Um, the phone is obviously very difficult for Sylvia to pick up when she's a staff of one. Um, emails are then tracked, and if we, you know, typically we get back to them. Um, um, but we ask that all applications uh, to the local license commission be within 14 days. Um, we are no longer doing special meetings uh, when we when we can not do them. So um, we meet every third Thursday of the month. Um, that's our regularly scheduled meeting date. Um, the phone number for the commission is 508-580-7805. And again, it's a very easy email. It's license at cobma.us. And again, we're open from 8.30 to 4.30. Um, I know Deputy Chief is trying to bring it up. One down, 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 down. There we go. So if no one knows Sylvia, this is Sylvia. Um, and again, <laughs> um, so the, these are the commissioners we have on the commission right now. Some of the names are actually wrong. Um, Commissioner Atlanta Holmes here, she's not on there. And Almond is now a full member. So we'll get some of the information. But there's a lot of information on the website. Um, all the applications are online. Um, instructions on special events are online what you can and can't do. A lot of the stuff that Deputy Chief brought up is right on this website. So there's really no excuses for you know, people not knowing some of the stuff. Again, if you have anything in particular or stuff that is strictly for a club or something like that that you're unaware of, uh, either call, email uh, the commission. Um, also, the ABCC, uh, the executive director, Ralph, says you know, he'll be um, um, after for questions. So if anyone has any specific questions about their business, um, Ralph and his team are willing to help. They answer the phone as well in Boston. So, I mean, we really have a very well-rounded um, team here at the city level with uh, working with all the agencies. Um, Deputy Chief, did you want to come down and say anything? No, I'm good. You're good? Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you for coming, everyone. I guess you are dismissed. Thank you.